able to see. Okay, there we go. Right, so welcome everybody to this online Constitution Unit seminar on the future of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. Um, I'm Meg Russell, I'm the director of the Constitution Unit and I'm gonna be chairing this session. Um, as I'm sure all of you who signed up know, the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which was passed in 2011, has become somewhat controversial. The Conservative Manifesto last year promised to get rid of it. Um, and very helpfully, um, whilst uh, the government is thinking about what it wants to do, two parliamentary committees have published detailed reports reviewing the operation of the Act. Um, the Constitution Committee in the House of Lords and the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee in the House of Commons, PACAC. Um, they both published their reports, which are full of a wealth of analysis and information uh, in early September. And we're really delighted to have representatives of both of those committees with us today to talk about their reports. Um, so our speakers include um, Anne Taylor, Baroness Taylor of Bolton, who is the chair of the Lords Constitution Committee. We were originally due to be joined by William Ragg, the chair of the, the Commons PACAC committee. Unfortunately, due to a clashing engagement, he's had to pull out at quite short notice. We are tremendously grateful that Lloyd Russell Moyle, a member of the committee, has come uh, to join us to speak uh, on their report. And then the third member of the panel, uh, last but absolutely not least, is Professor Petra Schleiter, who is an external fellow of the Constitution Unit um, and is a professor at the University of Oxford and provided some really invaluable evidence to both of the committee inquiries on overseas operations in this, these kinds of areas, how it works in other countries. So we're going to take the speakers in that order. It'll be Anne Taylor, Lloyd Russell Moyle, and then Petra Schleiter. Each of them will speak for about five minutes. Then we may have some discussion between the panel for around 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open out uh, to audience questions. Just some um, points of sort of administrative organization uh, before we begin. The session, as you just will have seen, is being recorded. The recording will be made available later on our website via our YouTube channel um, and we'll notify attendees when it's available. If you've enjoyed the session, then do please share the video uh, with your friends and colleagues. Um, if you have a question that you want to ask uh, in the question session, then please uh, send a chat, use the chat function and direct it to Alan Rennick, the deputy director of the unit. He's gonna be fielding the questions later on. He will gather them up into little groups of related questions and as by default he will invite the questioner to unmute themselves and if they wish to do so um, turn their video on in order to ask their own question. If you would prefer not to ask your own question perhaps because you don't want to be uh, in the video then indicate that to Alan um, when you uh, post it in chat and he will happily ask the question for you. So I think that's all of the administration out of the way. Uh, with no further ado, I am delighted to turn over to Anne Taylor, Baroness Taylor of Bolton, to talk about the Constitution Committee's report. Uh, thank you, Meg. Um, I think most people will be aware of the background to the Act, otherwise you wouldn't have tuned in. Um, but the Act, when it was introduced, the bill when it was introduced, was dressed up as something that would take power out of the hands of the Prime Minister. Uh, in fact, it was actually a deal between the Liberals, who'd always advocated some kind of reform of this kind, and David Cameron, who wanted some security for his minority government. Um, so it wasn't quite as simple as it seemed, even from the start. Um, the Act set a maximum term for a Parliament of five years, um, and many people thought that meant we would indefinitely have five-year Parliaments. There were, however, the two escape clauses, um, a motion in the Commons for an early election if it was supported by two thirds of MPs, or a successful no confidence motion and no government winning a fresh confidence motion within uh, 14 days. So that's the background. Um, and the first parliament lasted five years, uh, but then the act was uh, tested and found that it was actually uh, extremely straightforward for Theresa May to get an early election. Uh, Brexit then uh, stress tested it further with um, the government not being able to get 
the early election it wanted at first, but then you know pushing again. And therefore we ended up with a general election with both the main political parties saying that they would repeal the act. Now, when the act was going through, one of the concessions that was made was that there would be a review. And that review has to start within the next couple of months. And it was against that background that the Constitution Committee decided to get ahead of discussions at that time and actually uh, look at what the act meant and look what would be required to actually change the situation. And I think that um, when we published uh, our report in September of this year, there was a bit of interest, but I think that interest will uh, escalate further once that review um, is established. I think the basic conclusion that we came to, and probably the most significant conclusion, is you can't just get rid of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Um, people talk very glibly about repealing acts as if that's the end of it and everything goes back to the situation uh, that existed before. Uh, that simply is not true so far as the Fixed Term Parliament Act is concerned. Um, even something as basic as having any limit on the length of the parliament has to be uh, addressed. So I think that there is a, a real problem here. You can't simply re-establish a prerogative uh, that has been uh, abolished. Uh, the second concern that we flagged up was the role of the monarch in politics. We think it's particularly important that we keep the monarch out of politics. Some people would also say uh, we should try to keep the uh, courts out of politics uh, as well. So what we did was flag up some of the issues that were involved there, but also try to flag up what changes would have to be considered if the act or when the act is actually repealed. You can't just you know, wish it away, you have to have some grown up thinking about the kind of issues. So let me just uh, mention some of the issues that I think um, need addressing and will have to be considered carefully and I would hope stress test because you know the original act was not stress test so I think we've got to do that. The first question is should there be a fixed absolute maximum length and should there be some mechanism to allow early elections in certain circumstances so then if there's going to be a maximum what should that maximum be third point if there is going to be an early election that is um, required or circumstances demand it or a prime minister wants it um, should that election the calling of that election require the agreement, the consent of the House of Commons. And if consent is to be required, you know, what should the threshold be? Should it be 50% of the straightforward vote of those voting? Should it be 50% of the whole membership? Should it be two thirds? You know, how do we deal with that? And if consent of the Commons is going to be required, should it also be required for the exact date for the election, not just the fact of having it. And I think that these are the kind of questions uh, that are going to have to be addressed. Uh, and just to put down the marker, uh, as my time's nearly up, uh, the committee also made recommendations about prorogation because we all saw the difficulties that arose, that arose um, when uh, the government got itself into trouble on prorogation, trying to have five weeks. And of course, prorogation is very different from a recess in terms of recall and what uh, parliamentarians can do. So we do think that there will be quite some issues for this committee to the review committee to look at. And we try to indicate some of the areas that they're going to have to deal with. Sorry, I was having difficulty unmuting myself there. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, sticking absolutely admirably to time, um, but leaving us with um, some quite tricky questions um, to which uh, other panelists, I think the PACAC report went slightly further in 
providing some answers and some opinion on some of the points that the Constitution Committee simply raised as questions. Um, so let's go over to, to uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle and um, hear what the PACAC report said. Thank you so much for being here, Lloyd. No, thank you. Look, I will rattle through some of the, uh, the, the key points. Look, we focus on two areas, what the Fixed Term Parliament Act did and how it functions, and what considerations need to be made in replacing, of course, as you mentioned, both political parties uh, of government and opposition committed to repeal and we assume replace uh, a, 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 something that Anne, of course, touched on about whether you would need to replace or you can just uh, um, review the prerogative. Uh, the review committee um, had, uh, as, as Anne mentions, been established um, uh, in the bill previously. Um, uh, there was some doubt whether this was going to be established or not. The government has now confirmed that this will be set up. Our view is that this must be a joint committee of both houses um, because it must come to a joint decision rather than it being two separate um, uh, committees or a committee that is appointed by the government. We believe they should be house committees just as we do pre-legislative um, scrutiny joint committees at the moment. One of the issues that was raised with the Fixed Term Parliament Act was that it was rushed through Parliament and did not necessarily receive the sufficient scrutiny uh, at the time and it was clear that our view was that it was not just uh, suitable for the committee to review and then report uh, but actually the committee should review report and then there should be a further subsequent set of full debates uh, within both houses uh, because part of uh, this is also about building confidence in both houses that the act can be followed and part of the problem that we that we had was not necessarily the wording of the act, but it was the political problems and considerations that we had around Brexit. And we, we were concerned that those two uh, shouldn't necessarily be confused. Going back to the original purposes of the bill, of course, there was a duality in the purpose of this. It was to reform um, the, uh, the constitution, indeed um, uh, create a, a semi-fixed uh, parliament uh, uh, system. Uh, it's actually poorly named. Uh, we, 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 we said it wasn't ever a fixed term parliament act, it was a semi fixed term parliament act with not only the exceptions that Anne has made, but also the exception uh, that was used in the final stage, which was the always the ability to bring forward a short form bill, uh, which is what happened to break uh, the deadlock. Um, the other constitutional, of course, purpose was to remove power from the prime minister towards the legislator. And we think that it has achieved some of that, but we're not quite yet sure whether the balance in that has yet been achieved uh, as should be. And of course, there is the political purpose uh, of, of, of the act, uh, which was, of course, to make sure the Lib Dem partners um, didn't suddenly feel like the, the prime minister could pull the rug from under them. We concluded that whatever system replaces the Fixed Term Parliament Act, it must be able to for, support, of course, majorities, but it also must be able to support coalition governments, which have become more regular in recent times as populations have become more divided um, and less, uh, um, uh, uh, and we've had less uh, majority uh, governments, although uh, this current one uh, um, uh, does have a, a very large majority. There was some discussion that we held on the prerogative. Can you restore the prerogative? Can you not restore the prerogative? My personal opinion is that we're kind of um, dancing on the head of a pin a bit on, on some of this kind of thing. Does it, does it matter? Is anyone suggesting that we will just repeal and replace with prerogative? I'm not sure any of the political parties were actually suggesting just to repeal and, and, and replace as was anyway. However, I think that there was evidence that it would be extremely difficult um, to restore the prerogative if it was ever possible. Um, and it, you're on a hiding to nothing to try and just uh, go down that route. So it was clear, uh, it was clear in the evidence, of course, from the, uh, in 2011, that there was an intention to abolish the prerogative. And whilst the wording we can argue around, uh, that was, um, that was uh, less important. So we, what we said is that the government should not uh, rely on reviving the prerogative. They should not even try. And what they needed to do is instead establish a new robust system for dissolution 
and calling elections uh, in the UK. And we say dissolution and calling elections because that was one of the stumbling blocks, of course, uh, this last time round in terms of the power still resided predominantly in the executive in terms of the dissolution process. Um, in terms of early elections, it was clear that much of the concerns of the Fixed and Parliament Act was in terms of uh, uh, um, the political inability for an early general election to be triggered within dates that all parties felt comfortable about. And it had a supermajority. We recommended the supermajority should not be further entrenched. Um, and whilst we didn't suggest necessarily it should be further weakened, um, it was important to allow valves uh, um, to get around that supermajority when needed. Otherwise you um, have a system of paralysis. On the issue of confidence, um, it was clear that, um, and this was set up by our predecessor committee, confidence remains central to the system of parliamentary democracy in the UK. The Fixed Term Parliament Act actually codified and restricted the ability to call confidence, um, uh, where no confidence votes were laid down in a certain particular way, um, and they triggered uh, um, uh, a, a election. It did not replace, of course, the existing ability to uh, conventions on broader confidence, but it did de-link the ability to call an election um, with some of those broader confidence uh, issues. Uh, we said that a mixture of statute and convention remains the best way, but it does require actors to engender in some mutual trust. And it also probably does require, uh, and we suggested that there should be an ability for the government or other parties potentially to affix a confidence vote, which would trigger the Fixed Term Parliament Act on other substantive um, pieces of uh, um, uh, either legislation or votes. Um, and we felt the lack of ability to do that had actually weakened the hand not only of government, but also of the legislator to be clear on what the confidence uh, was about. And the Fixed and Parliament Act does not, of course, um, as the government has asserted, divorce confidence totally from dissolution, but it did do uh, that break. Um, uh, and it caused that unacceptable situation where we were left without a government with legitimate authority. So providing the House of Commons with the power to set the date for election was also another area that we thought would have helped solve uh, uh, the um, paralysis. Uh, it could be reinstate the uh, Prime Minister's ability to attach that into a confidence motion, or it could be um, uh, that uh, there was some other automatism uh, that was much clearer. Uh, but that needed to be part of the review committee's terms of reference, and they needed to come forward with a solution to that. Uh, in terms of uh, prorogation, um, we considered the, the prorogation in light with the Supreme Court's decision with um, Miller Cherry, and I was a, um, a party in the Cherry case, so I should uh, um, uh, declare that in, in, in that sense. Um, the recommendation of the committee was uh, that um, the arrangements to prorogation should also be included in the review committee's terms of reference. The committee didn't necessarily agree um, uh, whether it was right or not that the courts had intervened. My personal feeling is that actually in some areas it is right that the courts intervene in constitutional uh, issues, and I think this was, but there was a nervousness of course about the court's um, uh, requirement to be pulled into what had seemed to be a political discussion. Now there is, a, there is disagreement of what is political and what is constitutional, and sometimes these things overlap. My feeling is the dissolution discussion was a constitutional discussion and not a political discussion. Many of my other committee members feel uh, felt that it was a primarily political discussion, not a constitutional discussion. That is where sometimes you do need the courts to uh, enter those grey areas because uh, we're never going to necessarily agree. And the statute needs to outline clearly uh, where those areas are. Those are, the, those are the key things that we found. Thank you very much, Lloyd. And I realise listening to both of you how incredibly unfair it is to ask you to summarise in about five minutes such long and detailed reports on actually something that's also quite a complex subject, as I think if anyone here wasn't already aware is becoming clear when we listen to the speakers. There, there's lots of issues in these reports. Petra, um, uh, we very much look forward to hearing from you and I hope that you might be telling us a little bit what um, overseas practice would suggest the answer to some of these key questions perhaps ought to be. So over to you. Absolutely, thank you, Meg. I'll just share my screen. Okay. 
Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so my job is to uh, place uh, the debate about the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and possibly repealing it in comparative context. Um, and as Anne uh, pointed out, part of the objective of the act was, of course, to stabilize the coalition, but part of it was also uh, to create permanent constitutional reform and tra transform, um, sorry, transfer power to call an early election from the PM to the Commons. That actually aligns the UK better with constitutional practice in other Westminster democracies, which have increasingly curtailed the power of a PM to call an early election, and also with practice in other parliamentary democracies, which tend to check the power of executives to call early elections. And I'll talk more about that and explain why that is the case. But first, that takes us to the question two, which is, what is the democratic purpose of early elections? And generally speaking, um, in constitutional terms, uh, the dissolution of a parliament is a really serious step. And normatively, it is difficult to defend as democratically desirable constitutional rules that allow parliament to be dissolved for a PM's partisan advantage. And so for that reason, the majority of parliamentary democracies have constitutions that do allow general elections, but generally only as a way of resolving gridlock. Um, and in comparative context, therefore, the default expectation for voters and parties is that a popularly elected parliament will last the full term unless there is that sort of gridlock. Um, and that encourages longer term thinking about policy making. It also provides assurances to parties who enter coalitions, as um, Lloyd point pointed out, and who support minority governments, that a PM will not call a snap election at the earliest possible opportunity. And that is actually an important point to consider for the UK, because we've seen the secular decline of the biggest party's vote share and an increasing incidence of minority and coalition situations in this country. Um, now, most comparable parliamentary democracies um, don't give the PM to call uh, an early election as and when he or she sees fit. And the reason for that is um, that it's unfair. So why is it unfair? Because PMs will call early elections when they expect to win. Um, they can exploit the unpreparedness of the opposition or of their coalition partners. They can try to avoid blame for poor policy choices by calling an election before the consequences unfold. And they can try to take credit for fortuitous developments such as economic upturns that actually have nothing to do with the government's policy. And so in a study of 27 European democracies, we've shown that cumulatively these advantages actually generate a vote share bonus of up to 5% for the PM's party. So whatever election calling rules replace the FTPA, really we shouldn't have those kinds of vote share bonuses for PM's party. We should have rules that safeguard the highest level of electoral fairness really. Um, then there's the question of whether restricting an executive's discretion to call early election causes deadlock. And that has been a real, really important topic in the debate about the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. And if we look at the comparative evidence, it suggests that no, it doesn't cause deadlock. Um, so early elections are regularly used to resolve gridlock when the power to call early elections doesn't lie with the PM. And I guess what caused gridlock in 2019 um, was more disagreement about the date of the election. And so um, the review of the FTPA should probably consider providing the House of Commons with the power to set the date of an election in order to avoid unnecessary paralysis. And if we look at other European democracies, we see that 20 out of 25 actually constrain the discretion of the prime minister to schedule the election date. And then the final two points that I want to make comment on the review process itself. So the first is an argument for a joined up review uh, process. The FTPA is only one part of the government's wider constitutional reform agenda that is outlined in the 2019 manifesto. And as we all know, and as, as the previous two speakers highlighted, election calling rules actually interact with confidence and no confidence procedures with parliamentary prorogation, with executive legislative balance. 
and the government is also considering other reforms that will change the constitutional balance in each of these arenas. These reforms should not be decided in a piecemeal manner because that will prevent an overall analysis of the cumulative effects of the reforms. So then the question is, what would be an appropriate reform procedure? And um, when comparable democracies are deciding big constitutional reforms, sorry about that, um, we've seen that since 1945, they've really moved in, uh, in the direction of adopting reform processes that are characterized by three features in order to ensure that the constitutional reforms are durable, that they are functional and fit for purpose, that they have cross-partisan support and enjoy popular legitimacy. And those three features are, first of all, impartiality, which means that the process can't be dominated by the government, expertise, which means we need the participation of experts in order to inform the constitutional uh, reform process either directly or as witnesses. And then increasingly what we see in comparable countries is direct popular participation, not just at the approval stage, but at the deliberation stage. So the best way to process the FTPA review is as part of the wider constitutional reforms that the government envisages and via a procedure that fulfills these three normative criteria. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Petra. Uh, always fascinating to hear fr uh, from the, about the data that Petra has collected uh, around Europe in particular um, and helps to put all of this in context. Um, so some of, I should maybe just say some of you may have noticed that my internet connection is a bit unstable. Uh, I've dropped out of this meeting a couple of times. So if I just randomly disappear, uh, poor Alan will take over the chairing, but let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, you were breaking up a little bit for me there at times as well. So um, it's the first meeting like this I've done from the office rather than home. And I'm a bit shocked to find the internet connection here is worse than my one at home. So that was a counterproductive move on my part. Um, let me ask the panelists one or two things before we open out uh, to the audience. It seems to me, I mean, it, the PAC Act made very clear that they think that the name of the act is a misnomer. It's not really about fixing terms, um, which was in line with the evidence that we gave and I think that Petra gave that really the central thing that the act does is remove prerogative power from the prime minister and give more power to parliament. And both of the, um, both of the reports emphasize that that was achieved and we saw that in 2019 when Boris Johnson was refused the election that he wanted at the time that he initially wanted it. But Lloyd, you, you mentioned words which were in the PACAC report um, about the balance not being right and also the Constitution Committee was a bit coy on whether it was a good thing or a bad thing uh, for this power shift to have happened. So I, I wonder whether I could tempt you to say a bit more. Lloyd, maybe you could say at least what you mean by not being sure whether the balance is right between executive and parliamentary power. Well, we thought it was quite right. Well, one has to be careful not to just speak on oneself when you go beyond what's written in the report. I think that broadly the committee felt it was right that there was some shift of balance of power. The question was, had the balance been defined so tightly that the prime minister when needing to break a deadlock or the executive when needing to break a deadlock was unable to do so. Um, and that's why we recommended that there should maybe be an ability for confidence votes and other, um, uh, uh, and other parts of that, including setting dates, et cetera, of elections to be attached to motions that the prime minister puts down to clarify that process so that there is an ability for the executive to be able to, I mean, you almost need a suicide clause. Does that make sense? You need a, a clause for the, for the government to terminate itself. And we felt that there wasn't, particularly if you're in coalition or minority situations, there's a danger that what's happened is you don't. And Petra was talking about the danger of the executive calling elections to make advantage of economic or um, political situations that weren't of their making. Well, it's also reversed. The opposition can make advantage in the system that we had at the moment. So I think that's what we meant by it was right that the balance was re-looked at, but has the balance been quite right? Has maybe too much power been taken? It's not that too much power has been given to the legislator, but it's whether too much power has been taken away 
from the executive and can you have both and we suspect okay. probably that you can but we didn't outline exactly uh, um, the details of that okay that's really useful because i wasn't sure actually whether you meant that the balance wasn't quite right in terms of Parliament hadn't yet got enough power, uh, because in some areas like setting the date of elections, uh, which was one of the things where actually you picked up the evidence from myself and Robert Hazel, you suggest that maybe we could go further in giving power to Parliament. So yes, it's quite nuanced, isn't it? Petra, I wonder whether you could respond to what Russell just said in terms, sorry, Lloyd just said, I knew I was going to do that at some point. <laughs> um, I've been called Russell all my life, so don't worry. <laughs> me too, me too, <laughs> but in a different way. <laughs> um, what are, Do suicide clauses, if you can put it like that, as Lloyd just did, um, apply in other countries? How do they manage that question? Yes, uh, so there are essentially two kinds of threats that a government can make when it um, declares a motion, a vote of confidence. Um, so the whole point of declaring a motion, a vote of confidence is that the government is making a threat and is trying to discipline um, its backbenchers, usually coalition partners, uh, and sometimes uh, threaten the opposition, right? And so the two threats are either an early election, which is what Lloyd was talking about, or government resignation. So the government can still absolutely invoke the threat of a resignation, and many constitutions just envisage that threat, but others also in, envisage the threat of an early election. So I guess the debate here is just, just how much of a threat, how much of a big stick do you want the government to be able to wield? And there's precedent, comparatively speaking, for both types of uh, regulations. Um, and then I guess the, the issue of the election date is an interesting one. And the solution that Lloyd uh, uh, mentioned is exactly the solution that many countries actually have provisions for in their constitution, namely that the PM can suggest an election date in the motion to call an early election, but it is parliament's uh, decision to actually uh, say yay or nay to that proposal. Yeah. I think the way this conversation is going shows that this question of executive versus parliamentary power is quite nuanced and complicated. Power over exactly what? Were there, were there any of these issues, Anne, on which your committee concluded firmly on one side or the other, um, on which powers maybe parliament should have a bit more of or a bit less of, or the executive should have more or less of? We very deliberately did not make specific recommendations because we wanted to set the scene for the discussions that are going to have to take place and what the review body is going to have to look at. I think there are two areas in terms of the, the triggers. Um, in a sense, because we've had the Fixed Term Parliament Act, I don't think you can write off Parliament in terms of its role in determining whether an election um, is going to take place or not. Um, I, I don't think there's an easy solution to the proportions or the percentages and things of that kind. But I think there are other questions such as, you know, what happened, what could trigger the need for a vote of confidence within the Commons? You know, traditionally we have looked at these things as if a government loses its vote on the budget they will almost automatically, or indeed automatically, have to face a vote of confidence. Now, you know, what role does Parliament have there? Should that certain important votes be automatically uh, triggering a vote of confidence? Should the government be able to say that any vote is going to have to be considered as a vote of confidence? You know, all of these things, I think, come into uh, the spectrum here. So personally, I don't think we will go back to just having a prime minister determining when there is going to be an election. But in a sense, you've got to remember that almost whatever um, legislation gets passed, whatever changes get made, the House of Commons can actually you know, still do notwithstanding votes. And we seem to be entering into an era uh, of governments quite liking uh, to say, notwithstanding this law or that law, this is what we're going to be doing. I'm getting indications from Alan that we don't have very many questions in yet. So let me try and prod the audience to encourage you to send your questions to Alan before asking another one um, to the panel in the meantime. Um, and of course, what you've all established um, 
I, I think, you know, a, a, a point of agreement between the two committees is you cannot simply repeal. You know, that's also a misnomer. We can't just get rid of the Act for various reasons. Um, and therefore, there is going to have to be another piece of legislation. And therefore, it is going to have to pass through both houses of parliament. So this becomes a political as well as a constitutional question in as much as what the two chambers will accept. And I, I think, is there any feasibility that parliament would allow through a bill which weakened its powers to the extent that the executive regained the ability to decide election dates? I just wonder whether you have, I mean, this is taking you a bit beyond the reports, but this has to be a consideration. If you were the government putting forward a bill, what what will Parliament accept on some of these issues about balance of power? And I, I mean, let me throw in an extra thing, I suppose, which um, it just occurs to me with this wasn't supposed to be a Labour panel. Uh, William Ragg, the chair of PACAC, is a Conservative MP, uh, but he's very kindly sent us Lloyd, uh, who is a Labour MP. So the Labour Party um, said in its manifesto as well that it wanted to get rid of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which I found a bit confusing. And I don't know whether Labour has a position now you're not here to speak for Labour but you may well know because that's part of the equation as to how Parliament is likely to respond if a bill comes forward and what the sort of point of compromise might prove to be. Anne would you would you like to say anything about the Lords? I think it may depend on on the process that is actually adopted over the next few months. If there is going to be a genuine genuine review and people have confidence in the membership um, it could be a review of the kind that uh, Lloyd was talking about, of uh, joint committees. Um, it may be that the government is considering a draft bill. I don't know. Um, what I would say is that we need to have a system and a review that actually um, generates confidence that the issues have been looked at thoroughly. And I think that the sensible thing will probably be uh, for the review to outline in great detail some of the options there so that they can can be stress tested by politicians who can then uh, you know, look at the circumstances in which they could arise and do some scenario planning of what would happen in, in different circumstances. And that's the way to get confidence because I think the problem with the Fixed Term Parliament Act was that it was done for a particular purpose and it was done in that hurry. Uh, therefore, some of the consequences that people feared on all sides of the political spectrum. I mean, the, I think the um, demand for a review came from Philip Norton, who is a Conservative peer. So it, it wasn't divided along party lines uh, just. It was a combination of genuine concerns about where, you know, what direction we were going to, uh, to go in. I'm slightly worried about Petra's suggestion that this um, should be part of the overall review that we were a uh, constitutional review that we were promised in the Conservative Manifesto because we've heard very little about that and I don't know uh, whether we can just wait for something else to happen. I think we have to have a review or a specific review of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Thank you Anne. Lloyd, do you have a, any feelings on what the House of Commons might find acceptable? Well, let's be honest, if you have a government with a 60 majority the, the actual question is, are there Conservatives that will lay themselves on the line for opposing the government on this? I don't think that this is an issue that Conservative members would lay themselves on the line for. There's not great public appetite for it. Um, so I don't think that Parliament actually has much um, hard muscle on this. You know, we don't have much hard power. There is, of course, I think the, the softer power of both the committee and other conservatives saying that it is undesirable to try and just go back to as was. In fact, if you go back to as was, there are dangers that the courts are involved. And I mentioned around um, my feeling is that I don't mind the courts being involved, but actually it's the conservatives and the conservative members often that were much more allergic to courts. Uh, being involved in this and so I think that is the angle that would mean that the government would be unlikely just to say let's reverse back to prerogative powers um, and uh, or, or even try and recreate some system of prerogative slash prime ministerial diktat powers because as soon as you've not got it underscored by a resolution <coughs> of the house there is a danger that you open yourselves up for some sort of uh, judicial oversight and review and underscoring it by resolutions of the house 
whether it's for dissolution or prorogation, actually, it protects actually the government. Um, so I think that that's where it will it will go. I don't think the government will just want to restore it back to uh, the prime minister themselves. They will want to protect themselves so that it doesn't end up in those courts. Anne, were you indicating you wanted to come back in? Well, yes. I, I mean, I, I think the problem with the courts in terms of what would happen with prorogation is that you would have the prime minister going to the monarch um, and then in the middle of this, when he's declared a general election, you then get the courts involved. And I think that that really does create a very problematic uh, situation. Uh, the Supreme Court sort of trying to make a judgment halfway through an election campaign doesn't really uh, set the election campaign off to uh, a good start or any start at all. So I think we've got to be somewhat clear that we have to avoid pitfalls such as that. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, Petra, it would be unfair to ask you what you think the parliamentary dynamics are, but let, you, let me ask you something else, which is that both of the other two speakers, I think, mentioned prorogation, the P word, um, and both of the reports have sections on that. And both of them don't really come down very firmly on what should happen. I mean, I can imagine why, because that became a very politicized issue and it may be quite difficult to get political agreement on a cross party committee on what should happen on that issue. But what would international experience suggest ought to happen on prorogation? Well, international experience doesn't speak so much to the ought, but I think one can think about the reasons why uh, international experience is what it is. So in comparative terms on prorogation, the UK is very much an outlier um, in the sense that the executive has this tremendous power to suspend parliament as and when it sees fit. This is very unusual uh, in a parliamentary democracy, and it's unusual for the simple reason that uh, it can be in the executive's interest to suspend parliament and the parliamentary check when parliament disagrees with actions of the executive or indeed uh, when the government has lost the confidence of parliament. And so for that reason, it is normatively undesirable for the executive to be able to parole parliament against its will. And that is precisely what is reflected in constitutional practice. Great. Thank you. I thought you might say that. <laughs> I think Alan now has a decent set of questions. Uh, Alan, would you like me to go over to you so that you can um, either give us some people's names to come in themselves or ask some questions for them? Uh, let's do that. Thank you. So you may, you may have noticed there's lots of interesting questions coming in the public chat. Um, and there's also some questions coming in uh, in private messages to me. Um, I suggest we do a couple of rounds. So first round, I suggest we've had three questions from John Cartledge, from Paul Parker, and from C. Silverstein. That's all right. I don't know C. Silverstein's first name. Um, so I suggest that if the three of you can find your unmute buttons, then we do you in a round. And then in the public chat, you might have noticed uh, comments from uh, three people who are quite prominent in these discussions, from Lord Butler, from Robert Craig, and from Gavin Philipson. Uh, so I suggest in the second round, uh, we bring those people in. So first up is John Cartledge. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question was this, that local, ele local government elections not infrequently result in a situation of no overall control, and local councillors have had least simply had to learn to live with this fact. It's not clear to me why the Commons should be different in this respect, or alternatively, uh, should local councils have the right to dissolve themselves at will? And of course, one of the points being that local, local councillors have fixed terms. Exactly, yeah. Okay, and then go on, Alan. Uh, yeah, so second up in this round, we have Paul Parker. Hi, Paul Parker from Quakers in Britain. Um, parliamentarians aren't the only people who need to know when a, fixed, when a parliament is going to end. And one of the issues with repeal of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act would be its implications for the Transparency of Lobbying Act, which is predicated on a, a regulated period um, before the date of a known general election. That's already causing problems when there's a snap general election. Um, so I wondered if the, if the panel have any reflections on the sort of knock-on implications for other legislation introduced since the Fixed Term Parliaments Act that's also going to need to be, to be looked at to avoid causing confusion with things like the regulated period ahead of a general election um, for campaigning organisations uh, such as mine. <laughs> 
Thank you, Paul. And third up, we have C. Silverstein. Hi, my name is Christopher. I work in the SMP Whips office for Clarity. And also, um, uh, so I'm asking a question on the practicalities of the implementation of this act. Um, the 14 day negotiation period, should the no confidence motion be successful, doesn't specify who runs the commons um, during that 14 day uh, uh, negotiation period, which means we could have between eight and 10 days of commons time run by a, a government that might not be there at the end of the period or at any part in that period, it might just disappear. So is that something that uh, the uh, reports or the panel have thought of? Uh, because that's a pretty big issue that we have ministers responding to questions that um, they that that they may not they may not be the government in two days, or they might be trying to introduce legislation in that period. Nothing is really specified as what happens in that fourteen day period. Um, that's a very big deal. Okay, that's an interesting question. I know that at least one of the reports, I don't now recall which one, went into some detail on the problems of the fourteen day period. I think maybe it was Anne's committee, but I, I don't recall for sure. Who would like to go first on this round of questions? Anne, great. Yeah, happily. I mean, the 14-day the period is the part of the act that hasn't been stress tested. Everything else has been tested and people have got round whatever provisions were there. Um, and you could have a situation where the prime minister lost and uh, just sort of sat in number 10. Uh, 10 and, and how do you actually get rid of them um, if there is a potential for another individual within their own party even to take over? Um, let alone another party. So, you know, it is a very vague area that has not been tested. And who knows whether it will be tested anytime soon or, or, or not. Um, on the other questions, um, John talked about local government uh, being on fixed terms. And could the council dissolve itself at will? Well, all the councillors could resign at will and therefore cause uh, a mini uh, election in their area on a particular point. I think it's not totally uh, unfeasible that that could happen. There could be a local issue that was uh, so significant, or it could be that the uh, local area wanted a mandate to send a message back to central government, maybe. Um, you know, if COVID wasn't the kind of situation it is, but a different crisis where local authority wanted to handle the situation in a totally different way, it, it might consider doing that. Um, Paul's point about lobbying was, I think, um, quite a significant one. Um, and I don't think it's difficult to amend existing legislation uh, to try to give some protection. Um, I, I think that should be possible, but it's not something I've looked at, but I would have thought it was possible. But there's also the question that is sometimes raised um, about snap elections causing problems for the electoral commission or returning officers. Uh, and that's often brought up as a problem. But I think that's a red herring because we have seen um, elections being held at very short notice and sometimes in quite difficult circumstances in terms of uh, the time of year not being the traditional time of year. So I think that those issues um, can be dealt with and, and shouldn't preclude uh, allowing for early elections. And indeed, it's inevitable that whatever set of circumstances that you have, you could have a crisis, a gridlock that did need to be resolved by an early election. So it has to be possible to deal with the problems, be the electoral or on lobbying. Thank you very much, Anne. Could I go to Petra next? Um, Obviously, some of the issues that John is raising about local government also apply to legislatures in other countries, which deal with this one way and another. Um, That's correct. Um, so, John, um, genuinely, totally fixed terms really only exist in one European democracy, and that's Norway. And the reason is that um, you want some mechanism to enable a national parliament to dissolve itself early or be dissolved early if things really cannot be worked out. So I'll give you some examples. And Anne actually mentioned a, an, an example earlier. So what if a government cannot pass its budget? There can be no agreement on the budget. Well, where does it leave a country, right? What if a government cannot be formed? Or what if a government loses confidence and there is, there is no way of establishing confidence in a government within a given time frame or 
Um, so for instance, within a 14 day period. Um, so I think those are the kinds of situations in which you might want uh, an early general election in order to resolve gridlock and to ensure that the country ends up being governable. So that I think is the reason that in general, we have uh, provisions that allow early elections as a gridlock resolution device. Um, but I think the, the question about the 14 day period itself, I think it was quite clear from the beginning that the silence of the fixed term parliament act about exactly what should happen in that 14 day period was perceived as problematic by many. And I think many are still worried about it. I think this is an area that does need clarification. Um, and I think I'll just skip the point about lobbying because that's not my area of expertise, that's okay. Thank you very much. Let's go over to Lloyd. Um, I mean, I think that the reality is that local councils are nothing like local government, a national government. Um, local councils generally are officer led and you have a load of um, much more than national government is. Uh, they are very often a running according to national government guidelines. They are in large part service delivery bodies, not, um, not uh, decision-making bodies. Th these are all criticisms for why we, to have a, maybe to have a better devolved situation in England to councils and to, um, to other bodies. But at the moment, the buck doesn't stop at the council. The council refuses to pass a budget. The government intervenes and sends the commissioner in. The council fails to deal with adult social care. The government has to intervene and send the commissioner in. You know, kind of all of those things, the government is the backstop. So you need the government to, 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 to always exist without some paralysis in decent times. Councils actually can get on pretty well with paralysis. Um, and particularly since uh, the, the cabinet system exists, although we don't have that in Brighton. Um, we've never, only very briefly did we have the, uh, the, the, the cabinet system, we did everything to avoid it. Anyway, um, on the Lobbying Act, uh, look, uh, this is a party political point, but from the party political point, the Lobbying Act is a deficient act that needs wholesale review, if not repeal. Um, it doesn't properly regulate actually lobbyists, you know, kind of, it doesn't actually produce a register of lobbyists who's accessing parliament or not. And what it does do is restrict civil society and trade unions on how they can uh, allow their members voices it, it, it doesn't do what it was meant to do and it because it was fixed for the fixed term parliament act it's problematic now that's not the committee's view um the committee didn't really look at that uh, issue entire uh, at all but it, it's it's not a deficiency of the fixed term parliament act it's a deficiency of the lobbying act that it is linked to the fixed term parliament act unnecessarily and it does cause problems um in that 14 day negotiating period I don't particularly see an issue with the government continuing when it's lost its mandate until a new government comes in. Gordon Brown was main prime minister after it was clear that he had lost the election, even when it was clear that the Conservatives and Liberals were negotiating and they'd stopped negotiating with him. So it was clear that there was going to be no Labour members in a new government, but they remained in government until the transfer date. In the US, you have that very often, don't you? You have the election and it won't be until the new year. The, so you have a lame duck uh, uh, government. I think that's pretty usual. And I think it would be strange for anything other than a government just to be effectively lame duck. And the politics of the issue would mean that they wouldn't get anything particularly through or they shouldn't get anything particularly through that is controversial in that time. And if they do, there's the risk that it will just be undone whenever the next government in that 14 day period, if it is formed. What is not mentioned in that 14 day period explicitly and where there is a weakness is how that new government were formed. If you, if you get rid of the 14 day period, so if you have the 14 day period, you have negotiations and a new coalition formed, it is totally unclear how the queen is signaled to call that new uh, representative. And that is a difficulty because again, there's a danger that you draw the monarch into having to make a distinction and yes, there were ways you could do that. You could potentially put an early day motion down and get a majority to sign. You could try and do a, a prayer, but those are not necessarily clear. And there possibly needs to be some clarity on when then a majority is formed, how that is indicated to the Queen, because at the moment it relies on the outgoing Prime Minister's goodwill 
to recommend to the Queen uh, that she appoints, I believe, and that is, uh, that is a flaw um, uh, and something that was discussed when there was a potential that 14 day was going to be stress tested. But as Anne said, it never actually was. Thank you very much. Yes, a feature of this whole debate and debates in the Constitution more widely is the extent to which people are wanting to fall back onto written rules, isn't it? Uh, and that was one of the areas where the rules were, I think, perhaps deliberately left unwritten in order that politics could resolve them. But politics was so difficult at that time that it was unable to do so. And people begin to say, well, if it's not written down, we don't have to do it. Um, and I think that's something we're seeing more and more of. Um, Alan, you have another round of questions. Um, maybe I should just say at this point, I am assured that the balance of questioners being invited gender-wise exactly reflects the balance of questions that have been submitted. So if there's anybody out there in the audience who would like to do anything about that, please um, feel free to do so, but do it quickly because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Um, Alan had called, I can see Robin Butler is hovering on his um, unmute button. Um, he had called Robin Butler first. Go ahead, Robin. Well, thank you. Um, I maintain that the belief that the previous arrangement before the Fixed Term Parliaments Act gave an unfair advantage to the Prime Minister is very largely an illusion because Prime Ministers are very unwise to call general elections when they're not strictly necessary to break a deadlock. And you couldn't have a more graphic illustration of that than what happened in the case of Theresa May in 2016. I also think that it's an illusion that is granted by minister to determine the date, because in practice, the dates on elections can be held are also very limited. So I believe that the Fixed Term Parliament Act was really a mistake. It was addressed to a, a problem that in practice didn't exist. Thank you, Robin. And let me pass back over to Alan, because I think I slightly stole his job there, and he may have other things that he wants to do. Uh, that, that, that's quite all right. No, I was <laughs> just going to invite Robert Craig and then Gavin Phillips, Phillipson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was going to bring up Sir Robin's evidence to the Constitution Committee in the House of Lords to, re to reiterate that, that I think he's absolutely right to say there's no advantage to the Prime Minister. In our system, I can't speak to other systems that Special slides talked about. Um, Brenda from Bristol was the was the direct response to what Theresa May did by calling a, a general an early general election. And the limited dates that we haven't talked about is absolutely right. It's spring or autumn in normal circumstances. So um, my my question is why I think why do the panels seem to underprice a return to the status quo uh, before the fixed term Parliament Act? Because it seems to me to be much more likely than people are giving it credit for. Um, I understand that there's a certain amount, well, there's quite obviously serious consternation amongst, uh, Mr. Russell Moore said more amongst Conservative MPs, but possibly generally about the potential for judicial intervention. But it, it, given the fact that the prorogation case on one view, which I happen to share, was an interference in the proceedings of the House of, uh, in the proceedings of Parliament in breach of Article 9, um, why do the, does anyone think that a statute would stop the courts getting involved if they were going to do that, rather than the prerogative situation? Uh, at least with the prerogative, if we went back to the prerogative, there's previous case law, it's not binding, but there is case law saying that that kind of uh, dissolution would be uh, non-justiciable in the courts. So in some ways, it's possibly more uh, like or less likely that a uh, dissolution using a prerogative would be judicially reviewed than a statutory uh, an attempt to exclude the courts using statute. In other words, it's not clear either way. Everyone knows the old system worked. So I, I'm, my question is, why do the panel seem to uh, seem to think that the a return to the status quo ante is so unlikely? Thank you very much. And Gavin Phillipson. Thank you. Um, I just want to say briefly, I think in response to Robin Butler's argument, if you read, the, I've read several biographies of Tony Blair's time as prime minister, there's no, I mean, he called both his elections early. He had enormous majorities. He did so openly and quite clearly to, to get maximum political advantage. So I just don't know how it can be seriously maintained that the ability to call the general election didn't give a major political advantage that was regularly exercised quite openly for partisan advantage by prime ministers. I think anyone who knows anything about British post-war history knows that to be the case. Um, I wanted to speak on, the, the point was really on, on the fact that the, the Act 
at the moment in section 27, and this was quoted by the, the evidence um, by myself and others on this was quoted on page 24 of the PACAC report, leaves, leaves it to the prime minister to call the date. And I, I remain firmly of the view that, that, that it was that, that it was the distrust of Boris Johnson. Obviously the idea was that he would not allow the general election to happen until after we'd left the EU if necessary, um, that made the Commons refuse to pass the motions under the act. So actually there was an irony there in that the prime minister, obviously when the government when the government sort of agreed to, you know, brought forward the fixed term parliament act at the time, they wanted to keep that bit of power for themselves. But it was an irony that actually the fact that they had that power actually took away their effective power to, to get the general election when they wanted it using the two thirds majority. Had the commons been able to set the date of the election, they would have passed it as PACAC says, I think that's shown by the fact that they quite readily passed the act, the 2019 act that did set the date of the general election. So it wasn't an early general election they objected to. It was an early general election at a time of Boris Johnson's choosing that they objected to. However, I mean, <clears throat> my view would be there's no chance at all of the government giving away that power. In fact, I think the government will want to get back the power from the House of Commons, preferably for the prime minister alone, at worst, perhaps as a compromise by a simple majority in the, in the House of Commons, I think the two thirds majority thing is, is dead. And the other thing they want to do is keep the courts out of it at all costs. And as I pointed out in my evidence, actually that cuts across one of their, what, what else they'd want, because the way to keep the courts out of it reliably is to ensure that parliament has a role in calling an early general election through a motion in the House of Commons. That's undoubtedly uh, squarely protected by Article 9. I think it's complete nonsense to suggest that Article 9 applies to prorogation. It's an executive action. But clearly a motion passed in the House of Commons would be subject to, would, would be fully protected by Article 9. So I think the most powerful argument for those of us who want to keep the Commons having a role and not want it to be pure executive power is to, is to waive that tempting prospect in front of the, in front of the government if you really want to keep the courts out, then give the House of Commons a role, but I think it will have to be by a simple majority. So that's a bit more of a comment, but comments on any part of that question are welcome from the panel. Thank you. It is probably inevitable as an event like this, that the lawyers start arguing amongst themselves, as you could see in both of the reports them doing in, uh, in written and oral evidence to the committees. <laughs> Um, this round, um, I suggest I start with Petra and then go to Lloyd and end with Anne. And um, this could be, I think it's likely to be the last round. So Petra. Thank you, Meg. Um, so in response to Robin Butler's point, um, I think I would agree with Gavin. Um, and uh, it's not just the case that, you know, generations of prime ministers have documented in their memoirs how carefully they evaluated the pros and cons of going for a general election at this particular point in order to maximize advantage for their own party. But it's also the case that when we look at the data and not just at the anecdotes, but at the data systematically, both within the UK and comparatively, um, it is very clear that that advantage does exist. Um, now, why not restore the prerogative? I think uh, the, the issue with restoring the prerogative is you don't know what you're restoring. And, um, and there is no precedent, uh, comparatively speaking, that I know of, of the restoration of a prerogative power by a democratically elected parliament. It would also be extremely odd for a democratically elected parliament to back away from an issue that is clearly controversial and complex and hand back power to a monarch in this way. So I think the way forward here is likely to be uh, legislation. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, uh, so why doesn't the, um, we just return back to the status quo? I, I think that, um, the feeling was that on the balance of the evidence that we heard that restoring the prerogative was too difficult and too messy. If you restore the prerogative by just removing the act, it wasn't necessarily clear the prerogative immediately came back. And if you restore the prerogative by enshrining it in an act, to some extent, it is no longer a prerogative. It is something you put in an act. So there probably is a complex way of doing that. Um, but we didn't feel that it had been explained why politically that would be advantageous to do something that was complex compared to something that was simple and clear. Um, we, uh, the committee was not bought on the idea, although many people, uh, particularly conservatives, were outraged that the Supreme Court 
um, uh, ruled on Miller Cherry. I don't think the committee was bought that it was a complete breach of Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. Uh, as I said, I was part of the Cherry, uh, I was one of the um, one of the people in the Cherry case. I clearly disagree totally that it was a breach of Article 9. It was a executive uh, um, uh, 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 power that was used effectively and it's quite right that the courts reviewed that and I think Gavin is quite right that the way that you stop that and that's and that goes back to your question Meg that you asked as well and the way that you stop of course um, uh, the courts getting involved is you make sure that it is something that is underscored by parliament um, uh, and as we said we didn't think the two-thirds should be enshrined any deeper we didn't make a comment about whether it should be rolled back or not. We did think there needs to be a vent to allow a, a simple majority. It might well be um, that there are some loopholes to that, but I suspect, Gavin, you're broadly right. We're back to simple majority being able to call it. Um, it might well be an absolute majority, uh, so it, it, an actual majority, i.e. not including abstentions, um, that might be where you fall, but I think the two thirds is dead. Uh, and I think underscoring it by parliament is, is, is possibly needed because they do want to keep uh, the courts out. Thank you very much, Lloyd. And um, my internet dropped out twice during, uh, during your comments there. So I shall have to listen back to them afterwards. Um, hopefully I'm back for long enough to invite Anne Taylor to come in um, and have the last go at this round of questions, Anne. Thank you, Meg. Um, I do actually agree with what, uh, much of what um, Lloyd has said about the prerogative and indeed my personal view, the committee has not made a recommendation about what's likely to happen in terms of a parliamentary majority being an absolute majority. Um, can I start though by saying, uh, picking up what Robin was saying about prime ministers uh, gaining advantage from their ability to choose the date of the election? I think Many prime ministers may have claimed that they were clever enough uh, to do this, but I do think that that's an absolute myth. Um, and having been around at various times when different prime ministers from Jim Callaghan to Tony Blair were determining the uh, choice of election date, um, I'm pretty sure that, um, yeah, what was claimed later was not always exactly what it was at the time. So I, 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 I Take Robin's point there and, and we'll stick by that. Um, in terms of some of the other um, issues, I do think it's important that we keep going back to keeping the monarch out of the courts and politics and everything as far as possible. And therefore, you know, I, I don't think we can simply um, restore the prerogative. And as, as Lloyd was saying, if you have uh, a statute, then it's not really the uh, prerogative. Um, the, the, the fact of what happened on Brexit uh, with Boris being denied the election at first and then allowed it because of some security about the date is a semi-valid one because the date was a factor. But I don't think any of us can draw any conclusions about anything from how Parliament handled Brexit. This is such a one-off situation. Uh, that we shouldn't draw too many conclusions there. I think my overall point would be that whatever we come up with has got to be stress tested as far as is possible and every combination of factors has got to be looked at in order to try to get a system that will stand the test of time. Uh, we don't really want to be revisiting issues of this kind every few years and throwing them up in the air and, and um, confusing them with, with other issues as well. My slight concern, having said that, is that no parliament can bind its successor and therefore we are always in danger of having the notwithstanding approach and that's something that it's very difficult to factor in. Um, and perhaps that's wise, but I think that that is also a reason why we have to stress test things very carefully. Thank you very much, Anne. And I hope I'm just about still with you. Um, one thing that the reports did agree on is that getting the process right is really important. And certainly the Constitution Committee 
when this bill, when the fixed term parliaments bill was going through parliament, uh, reported and was quite critical of the process and the extent to which policy was made too fast, things were not thought through. And I think that both of the committees agree that it's really important not to uh, repeat that mistake and we would certainly agree with that as well and hopefully the government's um, review committee will offer a further opportunity to think through some of these things in detail but it's unintended consequences tend to be difficult to completely avoid so we will see um, but I, uh, I'm not sure whether it's for me to have a view but I certainly agree with Anne that um, judging anything too much on the events of last year which were unprecedented really um, would be a mistake um, it's difficult to imagine that, and let's hope it doesn't all happen again. Anyway, um, it remains for me, um, we said we would finish this uh, absolutely at the latest by 2.15. There clearly wasn't going to be time for another round. I'm sorry to those of you who had submitted questions that didn't get in. Um, but I would like to enormously thank all three of our panellists for what's been a really enlightening discussion, for being here, sharing their um, ideas and wisdom with us and for giving up their time. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for having attended. Um, if you haven't been to one of our events before, I hope that you will uh, want to attend again. And if you're not on our mailing lists, then I would encourage you website and sign up for the mailing list for future events um, sign up to hear about our publications for our newsletter sign up to our blog follow us on twitter um, and go along to our youtube channel if you want to see this video uh, after the event and we'll let you know when it's available but for now i think all that remains to say is thank you so much to our panelists